Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Zero Waste Tips and Tricks for Sending Less to the Landfill. This is our third in our Art of Resilience Sustainability in the Twin Ports series. And so grateful for you all to have joined us today. This series is a joint effort between the College of St. Scholastica and the University of Minnesota Duluth Sustainability Offices to offer sustainable living tips and tricks for people living in the Duluth Superior Twin Ports area. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Erke. I'm the facilitator of sustainability at the College of St. Scholastica. And I'm Jonna Corpy, and I serve as the sustainability coordinator for the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete for your reference or to share with others that might find it useful. Uh, we also invite your comments and questions. So put them in the chat as you think of them and Ryan and I will do our best to answer them as they come up or ask them to our panelists. As for format, we are going to give each of our guests time to speak and then round out the last half of a Q&A session. Um, but before we get started, I um, want to just ground ourselves in zero waste. Um, so let me get my screen up here. Okay, so to get us in the mindset to talk about zero waste, we're going to do a little thought experiment. And side note, um, I'll be talking a lot about plastic waste, but obviously it's not the only form of waste in your life that can be reduced. And I hope our guest speakers today will touch on more than just plastic. So back to the thought experiment. You are hungry and in search of a snack or you're grocery shopping. So close your eyes, close your eyes, and imagine that <laughs> what you might reach for in your fridge, the cupboard, at the local convenience store, or throwing, in, throwing into your cart at the grocery store. How many of those items are packaged or wrapped in plastic? Open your eyes. So many things. Now imagine, where will that package go after you've eaten whatever's inside? For us, the landfill is really close and really close to Lake Superior, um, which is a little bit interesting um, for a placement. Another thing to think about is how long will that packaging exist after you throw it out? A week? A few years? More than 50 years? So too often we think that the life cycle of a product begins when we make a purchase and ends when we throw an item away. But in reality, what we see is only a small fraction of the journey. Stuff never really goes away and the vast majority is destined to sit in landfills or waterways forever, polluting our atmosphere, soil, and water. <laughs> yes, Francis, no, terrible. Um, so then there are impacts to human health. <laughs> From the processing of oil um, to create petrochemicals like plastic, to the consumption of cheap products laden with chemicals and packaged in plastic, to the landfilling of the waste, each step in the process disproportionately affects the poor and communities of color more than anyone else. And let's not forget about microplastics, which are often present in food or water and easily ingested into the body. A 2019 study found that humans ingest around five grams of plastic each week the same amount as a plastic credit card. And then what about plastic's impact on climate change? So the production and life cycle of plastic is fossil fuel intensive and a major contributor to the climate crisis. And the last thought, in just one day, the average American produces 4.5 pounds of waste. Waste has become a negative byproduct of daily life, but it doesn't have to be that way. And our guests today are geared up to share tips on how we start reducing our waste right now. So Ryan, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Jana, and um, thank you to our guests for being here. Uh, <laughs> and yes, uh, the babies in the house have spoken. Unacceptable, right? But how do we figure it out? So we have a number of guests here today. We'd like to start off today's session by each of you briefly introducing yourself. Um, and I think please share who you are, what you can do, and how you can become involved with this work. I know, Michaela, we had, we had talked about in the past of you kind of sharing a little bit about April, um, but I think what we'll do for the sake of time today is just do a quick round robin here and introduce yourselves briefly. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off with April, and um, could you just introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll get back to you with a more full um, presentation. Yeah. 
Um, so can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Um, yeah, I'm April Hepikoski. Um, I run uh, Zero Waste Duluth, and um, I've been living a zero waste lifestyle for about uh, six years now, since 2014. I've been pursuing a zero waste lifestyle, and um, yeah, and just uh, within the past maybe four years, I have been doing a lot more community um, advocacy for zero waste living um, around the Duluth area and surrounding areas. So yeah, I'm really happy to be here with all of you. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, Michaela, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, I am a senior at the College of St. Scholastica, and I've completed a major in sustainability and environmental science, and I also work in the sustainability office with Ryan and um, Claire Anderson. Thank you, Michaela. Elena? Hi, I'm Elena. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am a senior this semester. It's my last one. I've been working with, underneath Jana with the Office of Sustainability specifically working on waste for the most part. Um, and I will graduate with environment, sustainability, and geography. And Claudina. Hi, I am a senior at the College of St. Scholastica. I am double majoring in psychology and sustainability. And this semester and continuing next semester, I'm doing a research on like how to um, encourage people to recycle more. So, yeah. Great, I'm so excited to hear from you all. Um, we're gonna start out with April um, to share a little bit about, a little bit more about herself and her story and kind of some advice or offerings she has for us. So thank you, April. Yeah. Would you like me to start my presentation? That'd be great. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Get this up for you guys. Are you able to see my screen okay? Yes. All right, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna switch my slide here if it'll work. There we go. Um, yeah, so just to share a little bit about my background um, for why I started pursuing a zero waste lifestyle is actually uh, due to my health. I was, um, in 2014, I was diagnosed with SIBO and endometriosis, which um, I was told were both incurable and um, and so the treatments that I was offered for SIBO was antibiotics, uh, possibly two weeks on, two weeks off for the rest of my life. And uh, for endometriosis, um, I was told I'd have to take hormone pills every single day. And um, for me, those were not options um, that I wanted to take for various reasons. Um, I had come off hormone pills uh, before that because they were making me sick. And antibiotics, really, I feel need to be used um, on a, you know, a much more minimal basis than, you know, like continually for your whole life. Um, and so I had asked, you know, are there any natural treatments for these diagnoses? And I was told no. And that was really the big catalyst for um, my lifestyle change um, for everything in my life. And um, one in particular that that affected was um, my buying habits. And, um, and because when I started um, researching natural treatments for endometriosis and SIBO, um, I came across uh, research that was done about how plastics actually affect our health. Um, when we ingest plastic or when our food is wrapped around plastic, it actually puts a hormone um, in our, or a chemical in our food that when we ingest it, it mimics the hormone estrogen, which is a big player in endometriosis. And so after I learned about that, I looked in my fridge and in my pantry, uh, just like the uh, activity that John had just had us do. and almost everything was wrapped in plastic and I was just amazed at how much um, I didn't even realize how much was wrapped in plastic and how all of that was contributing to my health problems and so immediately I started researching how to live a life um, and and acquire food without acquiring all the plastic and having it uh, our food contaminated by plastic and so that's where I came across Zero Waste Living, um, was actually 
through um, trying to reduce the plastic packaging in my life. Um, that's a big part of zero waste, but um, as we go through my slides, that's not the only part of zero waste is the packaging. There's so much more to it. But um, that's where I got started is just my health is affected by um, partly to do with plastic. And so just dramatically reducing that, um, I feel really helped. And I actually can happily say I don't struggle with endometriosis or SIBO anymore. And I don't, I did not take antibiotics. I did not do hormone pills. Um, a lot contributed to that, but I believe a big part of it was um, reducing the chemical um, exposure that I had through living a more natural and zero waste life. Um, that picture that I showed actually here is from a cleanup that I did on Lake Superior. So we know we have a big plastic pollution problem around. Um, and so we can see how that plastic is starting to really break down. Um, and that's how I got really started in doing this community work was seeing the devastation in our lake and in our um, community um, on the land too uh, where, with so much plastic pollution. So um, just getting started, what I did first was I did a trash audit. So I looked in my trash can first um, to see, you know, what what is in there um, that I can start reducing um, the amount of trash that I create. And so what I found was that the majority of my trash at that time was like chip bags because I love eating chips. And I thought, okay, I can make the biggest change in my trash right now if I just stop buying chips in bags and find a different way to enjoy chips without having to acquire this plastic bag. And so what I did first, which isn't totally zero waste, is, um, but it was my first beginning step, I started buying chips in a paper bag from Chipotle. And so that was just my first step into trying to reduce my plastic consumption, um, since that's where I was starting with my health. Um, but then um, to get it even more zero waste, because zero waste is really about reducing all of your resources, not just plastic. Um, that's, you know, um, the paper bag is a single use product. Um, even though I can compost it at home, um, doesn't mean I necessarily have to be taking home this paper bag and using it. Um, so my next step was to, uh, find, find a way to enjoy chips without even taking that paper bag home. So my next step was to buy, uh, potatoes and either bake my own or, um, fry my own, um, make apple chips by dehydrating apple slices, um, making kale chips in the oven. So there were a lot of really fun ways that I found um, where I was able to reduce those chip bags. And that was my first step. And so now I don't buy chips in plastic bags anymore. I just go to the store and buy loose apples and loose kale and loose um, potatoes or whatever you want um, to make into a chip. And that's how I started. So that's what I recommend to everybody is to just get started by looking in your trash bin and finding one type of item that you want to reduce the amount of trash. Um, so that could be chip bags, it could be maybe the meat packaging. Um, so um, either pick one where it would make a really big difference like I did with the chip bags or pick something that's really easy like maybe um, maybe you buy oranges in the plastic mesh bag. Um, this could be a really simple one um, where you just buy oranges loose without the plastic, that plastic mesh bag. So um, it's just really important to, um, you can do more than one at a time, but what I recommend when you're getting started is just pick one type of item to reduce, um, one type of item of trash that you make um, to reduce at a time because when you do it slowly, then you will uh, be making that a sustainable change for you. It's going to, you're going to stick with it longer um, when you do one at a time and you adapt it slowly into your lifestyle. Um, because if you, if you do too many at once, it can get overwhelming and you can easily feel like you want to give up. So you want to do this in a really sustainable way for you to keep up this habit. So um, uh, the picture on the left is the Duluth Superior landfill actually. And the picture on the right is um, one of my trash audits that I did once I was able to get down to about a mason jar of trash for one month. 
So um, even when you get down to a really small amount of trash that you create in a um, certain amount of time, you know, there's always still room for growth. So it's fun to even do a trash audit, even at that time to see where else um, I can focus on next. So some easy ways to uh, reduce um, your waste is uh, first just refuse what you do not need. Um, that could be the plastic straws um, at the restaurants, you know, just asking for no straw to be put in your drink. Or um, when you go out to a certain event that has, you know, either like styrofoam or paper plates, those single use items, swapping single use items with reusable alternatives is a great way to reduce your waste. Um, and one way to do that is by making a zero waste kit and to bring with you wherever you go. So the bottom picture there is a zero waste kit that I typically have in my car with me or um, going out. And that just includes a tote bag if I am going uh, on a whim like grocery shopping quick um, or to a store so I don't have to take the paper or plastic bag at the register. I have a couple mason jars in there if I need to stop in at the bulk store at Whole Foods or Quilke Natural Foods where I normally shop. If I need to get some honey or peanut butter or something, I can quick bring a jar. Um, I have a Pyrex with a sealable lid in case I need to go somewhere maybe to get fish from Super One at the meat counter. If I want to get some locally caught fish, I can bring my container in there. I usually go to the West Duluth one and, and ask for them to put it in there instead of having them put it in a plastic bag. Um, other things that are good to always have with you are a reusable plate bowl, uh, the utensils, knife, spoon, fork, and the cloth napkin, a reusable straw, reusable chopsticks. Those are all things that come in handy so that when you're at that uh, at some sort of event that's serving a meal that has single use bowls or plates or uh, plastic cutlery, you can take out yours from your bag and you can use that instead. The chopsticks I always carry with me in case we go to sushi that I don't have to use the single use item, the single use wooden uh, chopsticks. And then the last one that I have in my kit is the, the bulk food um, produce bags. So if you're buying, you know, mushrooms at the co-op, um, you don't have to put it in a plastic or paper bag. You can put it in your cloth bag. And that's the next uh, easy way is just to go to stores and start bringing your own containers, um, like the jars and the bags and, and the Pyrex. Um, for your stuff to go in instead of putting it in a single use bag. And then the last easy way is just start a compost pile. Composting can feel really overwhelming, but it's actually a really easy thing to do. You just, um, if you have a space outside that you can just start dumping stuff in a pile, it can be as simple as that. Just make sure you're adding, you know, browns to that as well. Um, to, Cause the food scraps that you add to a compost pile are more the greens. And um, if you can add browns to that, it'll make a really good compost. The browns would be like uh, dried leaves and stuff like that that can help really balance out those greens. So um, I could go much deeper into compost, but again, it can be as simple as just an open pile in outside. Um, and then some more challenging things that you can do, um, but they're really fun uh, ways to cut uh, down on your waste are first shop secondhand for things instead of buying something new. Um, I do this a lot. I hardly ever have to buy something new now. Um, there are so many ways that you can find things secondhand. First of all, look in your own home. Shop your home. What do you already have? Um, do you need to buy new containers for storing things or can you use your old, um, instead of recycling a, a storage tub, can you put that can you use that storage tub instead um, for, um, you know, storing things instead of buying something that would store something? Um, also looking at secondhand shops or looking at garage sales or, uh, the, you know, social media garage sale sites are always great too for um, finding things secondhand. Um, the other fun thing, but can be more challenging and overwhelming, is learning wild edible foods and foraging for them or growing your own, which can feel less intimidating, um, but does require time. Um, so this is a great way nature provides us um, plastic 
free food, you know, it's um, providing us food that does not have all this packaging. That's where, you know, our, our food comes from nature. And so when you're connecting with nature and learning how to forage and learning those edible foods, it's just a great way to um, bring things into your home that normally would have packaging like food. Um, and it's also free and it's just a really fun way to cut down on that waste. Um, another way to cut down on waste that isn't like packaging related is um, finding a way to um, go, um, go somewhere instead of driving, um, ride a bike, run, walk, um, there's lots of different ways to get places um, without having to drive and that can really reduce your um, resources that you use. And so um, something that I did, I challenged myself last summer and I've been able to keep it up this summer is that I don't, um, I don't typically drive to a place if it's um, less than 10 miles from my home. Um, I typically will take my bike and do that. And it's really just building a habit around these different things to reduce all of the different resources that you use. Um, so navigating zero waste in relationships and inspiring others um, to live a lower impact life. Um, this is a really big topic, but just to go briefly on it, um, what I do personally is that, um, so my husband and I are on kind of different journeys for zero waste. We're on a different um, level of how much we, we incorporate zero waste in our habits and our purchasing um, decisions. And so it's really important that we make sure that we are just um, really trying to just own our own, our own decisions and our own um, what we buy and not really, you know, pushing it on our family members or other people, just really looking at, at it as you are a role model and what you find val um, as a value to yourself and just living what your values are. So if this is something that you want to be doing, you know, focus on um, reducing the, the things in your life, focus on the steps that you can do that, um, that can help your household without pushing it on family members um, because that isn't, that's more of, it can add negativity to a, um, a relationship. And so we want to keep it really positive and just showing how we can do it. And so one thing that I do is I do a lot of our grocery shopping and um, one, that's one way that I can bring in what I want um, for zero waste shopping. You can see my picture on the left side here. Um, that's a typical grocery haul. And so I, I do a lot of the shopping because that's what I want to be bringing in all of that into my home rather than um, putting that on my husband, which can feel stressful to him if he's not quite at that place yet. Um, so, and then also for just inspiring others, um, you know, when I run my my page or, you know, even on your own Instagram or Facebook page or wherever you um, share information that you find valuable, um, just share it with other people in that way, um, in a really inspiring and positive way. And um, something that I do is, you know, just getting people together to do beach cleanups, getting um, that plastic pollution and all the different type, types that are polluting out there um, and just getting people really hands-on involved who, who want to be. So, um, and then advocating for zero waste in the community, um, different ways that I do this is um, I just start conversations with businesses, either uh, in person or through email. Um, if there's a specific change that I want a business to make um, that is similar, that um, is, geared towards zero waste, um, I will just, you know, request that um, during conversations. And um, so I have done that, you know, at like Quilke Natural Foods, I shop their bulk section there. And if there's something that I really want um, that they don't have in the bulk section, um, there's so, op a lot of places are so open to just um, having us uh, offer our ideas and 
And then they will, um, so like I wanted gluten-free noodles and they didn't have that in their section. And so I asked, can you get that in the bulk section? And they were happy to do that for the next time that I came in. And so just starting conversations and requesting different changes that you um, have in mind. Um, sometimes that's all people need is just an idea. Um, I'll try to keep these other parts really quick since I'm running out of time, but um, other ways that you can work with the wider community is through uh, different groups. Um, one group that I work with is called Vega Duluth and this is where you can speak out at city council meetings um, for like big citywide changes um, for ordinances that would reduce um, a large amount of plastic um, and waste in our community like the single-use straws were um, at restaurants and styrofoam takeout containers and single-use plastic bags at uh, the stores so trying to pass ordinances that will allow for um, you know these these items to either be available only on request for people or uh, switching to more of a compostable alternative um, so and then also the last thing that I try to do is just, you know, give recognition to people on social media that are doing the zero waste work, um, whether that's, you know, restaurants or stores, um, just to support their business and also share them as a resource for the community. And anybody can do that um, on their pages and just through conversations, just sharing this information. So everybody has it for what you do, where you shop. Um, and who you support. Um, and I always try to prioritize places that um, offer the zero waste option. So over ones that don't, um, of course, you know, can't do that all the time, but it's nice to do that if there is an option. So um, yeah, that was super brief. Um, but if you want more, you can follow Zero Waste Duluth on Facebook and Instagram. Um, that's where I share about more of my lifestyle and what I do. And then, um, BagotDuluth.org is a place where you can join more citywide efforts. And um, I also run my preschool, uh, Zero Waste as well, which is a nature-based preschool on my hobby farm. And I blog about what I do there on ZeroWasteNatureSchool.com. So yeah, that is, that is all of my presentation. Thank you guys for having me. I'm gonna stop my share. Thanks so much, April. That was really great. And we're excited to hear some more in the, the Q&A session a little bit later. Um, Claudina, we're going to ask you um, if you could do, we heard who you are, but could you tell us, spend a few minutes about talking about the research that you're engaged with this semester? Yes, I can do that. So I was going to just talk about my research, but I think I'm going to go ahead and share a PowerPoint that I used to previously talk about my research. So if that's okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the research that I'm doing right now is about how do we encourage people to recycle more. And that is like very important because like the US is a consumer based society and every year uh, the amount of waste um, that is generated is increasing. For like an example, um, from during the year of 1960, approximately 88.1 million tons of waste was generated. And then in 2017, that amount increased to 267.8 million tons of waste. And um, it has a negative effect on people's health. And this graph shows the distribution of the waste that was generated in 2017. And as you can see, a huge percentage of that waste ends up in landfill and waste that ends up in landfill obviously um, has like le it leaks leach toxins into the environment and the soil and it affects the health of people who live in that community so um, the purpose um, of this is to divert um, the amount of waste that ends up in landfill and instead goes into recycling of course recycling is not like a safe like uh, like solution to this problem, the best way to go about it is to reduce your consumption and reuse things. And so how I'm going to do this research is like it, there's two aspects to my research. 
the first part of it is a survey portion and it's about getting to know the students and understanding their recycling behavior, how they feel about it, um, thoughts that they thought about doing. And it also measures like what they actually do and how they feel regarding like waste consumption mm -hmm. and management practices. And the last portion of it um, looks at what kind of knowledge do they have regarding like recycling? How do you recycle? What is not, is recyclable and not recyclable? And then the intervention portion um, involves like a poster that will provide um, feedback on their recycling like habits. So I will have a goal and the goal will be, will depend on the amount of waste that was generated um, from the baseline data collection. So like there's three portions three parts of my um, intervention. The first part is collecting baseline data. So I'm, every day I'm weighing waste in um, one of the dining areas. And there are three recycling bins in this area. So I weigh them every day. And uh, this week is my last week of weighing them. And then at the end, I'm gonna add all of the um, pounds of waste that was generated. And I'm gonna use that as the goal for um, the second portion of the intervention. And the purpose of it is to get people to recycle more to meet that goal or to go beyond that goal. And I will use feedback to tell them, okay, where are we at at achieving this goal? And so this is, oops. Okay, so I don't know what happened there, but um, this is just a picture of like, um, how what I've been doing so far. So I've been taking doing spot checks, taking pictures of each of the recycling bins in that area. And as you can see, there are there I've been noticing contaminations and these bins. So there's either liquids, um, dirty containers in there. So some are just like loose water in the bin. So which destroys a lot of the like especially papers that are in that bin. So um, the people's uh, recycling habit is not the greatest. So that is an area that needs improvement, um, which my research is not focusing, addressing the uh, effectiveness of people's recycling behavior, which is, I guess, like a limitation to the study because it's focusing on getting people to recycle more. And to um, be impactful, people need to recycle, right? Otherwise that waste is not gonna end up being recycled. So. Yeah. Thanks so much, Claudina, for uh, introducing us to your research that you have going on. So um, if you are a CSS student, um, she has sent out a survey to our, our campus about asking for that. And so um, and Michaela also put that in the chat. So if you have not participated in the survey and you are on the, the St. Scholastica campus, please fill it out and help her out with her research. Um, the last couple of speakers that we asked to share today were just what, is, what does it look like to be zero waste or trying to be um, reducing the amount of waste you produce as a college student? And so we asked Michaela and Elena to kind of um, share a little bit about what's the, their day-to-day -day routine. You saw a little bit of what April has for um, her life and I'm guessing there's gonna be some overlap, but you know, being a student has some um, other unique aspects to them. So um, uh, I know, Michaela, I know you have a photo, kind of the stuff you have. Elena, do you have a photo or you have your bag that you can show us stuff? Um, how about, I'll just call, Elena, do you want to share first what you're doing and then you can hand it off to Michaela and you guys can both, you know, at, at some point, but for the sake of sharing screens and everything, we'll point to you first. Sure. Yeah, I could start. Um, let's see. Cool. Can everyone see the image? Hopefully. See yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so we will start with what's going on in that chaotic fun image right there. Um, we'll start with the one that I think is probably not most detectable and that is the blind tiger. That is a homemade beeswax wrap. Um, one way that I like to be mindful about my waste is whenever I buy a t-shirt or I guess when I'm shopping and I see something at like savers buying secondhand, I will see a shirt. I'm like, wow, that's great. I don't know if I can fit into that. Well, I 
still buy the item and then I can repurpose it. So that specific shirt was made out of 100% cotton and you can make that into your own beeswax wrap with just a hot iron and beeswax. And then I use it, I put the quarters over the eyes to symbolize going to the vending machine at UMD, uh, or I guess it's more of a gumball machine, but it's not gumballs, it's chocolates. Um, that's one way that I can get candy because I love candy uh, while being zero waste is with beeswax wrap and using what is already available um, at the UMD campus, I hope. Uh, St. Scholastica is something similar. I really hope so for the sweet tooth people out there. Um, but yeah, that's the beeswax wrap. Uh, the only thing with that, if you do end up purchasing one or creating your own, they have to be washed with cold water. Um, but they're amazing. It's gonna last me probably the rest of my life. And if it ever gets kind of, you can like reapply beeswax wrap if it starts to lose the specific texture that helps keep stuff uh, sealed and preserved. Um, so that's that. And another thing that you can do with uh, excess clothing and scraps is the thing in the top right or the top left, top left corner <laughs> is a headband that I created um, just by cutting the end of a t-shirt. Um, and I keep that in my backpack in case I want to work out or if I just want to put my hair up. Um, that's another way of just repurposing what I already have. Um, and next to that, I have a old jam jar that I can use to fill up water or get extra candy or uh, whatever else needs to get uh, stored just so I don't have to buy anything else uh, to contain stuff or use plastic baggies or anything like that. Um, and I do also always have a reusable coffee mug too. That's a staple. <laughs> um, I, as well as that, I do also always have like a handkerchief, like a napkin, and you'll see that on the top right corner. That's a staple as well. And I also have stopped um, chewing gum because gum has plastic in it. There's a reason why it doesn't lose its texture at all. It's made out of plastic, it's made out of petroleum, um, but I still really like mint, as do most people, so I recommend Altoids because they come in a metal container that you could use for storage. And it's a really cute box and um, that's pretty much zero waste as well. However, if you are vegan or vegetarian, there's only specific ones that don't have gelatin, so that is another stipulation with sustainability because not everything is perfect. There's not the perfect sustainability. So Altoids over gum, even little things like that are important. And then I also carry around my handy dandy spork knife, um, which UMD sells them at the school store. I hope uh, St. Scholastica has that accessible as well. Um, but you could always just bring your own fork, knife, and spoon. It doesn't have to be something that formal and it, you can use what you already have that's best. Um, and as well as that, I always try to use a number two pencil as opposed to a mechanical pencil um, because that can be composted if you get rid of the metal and the eraser. Um, as well as that, I also have my U-card. I always carry that with me because we get free busing uh, with DTA and that really really reduces the amount of emissions that I have to use to get from point A to point B. And there's plenty of accessible um, bus lines for going to school and then also going to work or going downtown when socializing was an option. <laughs> um, very accessible in that term. Um, and yeah, that's just a small glimpse into what I try to do to be as zero waste as possible. And I feel like these are kind of easy things to start with and kind of help brainstorm. So I'm excited to hear what other people do and all of that fun stuff. So thanks for listening to me. Thanks so much, Elena. Um, that was great. Um, Michaela, I'm guessing you have some similar stuff in your uh, photo too. Do you want to share what you got going on? Yes, I do have a lot of similar things to Elena. We had um, talked about what each of us have and 
figured it was okay if there's some overlap. <laughs> so um, in my backpack, this is usually what I have. I'll have a reusable water bottle. Um, if I'm drinking coffee or tea, I'll have a coffee thermos. And then I also had this coffee cup in here. Um, and when we're in the office, I'll usually just use the cups that we have there. In my lunchbox, I have uh, reusable or just utensils that I'll bring from home and then bring back home to clean. I have, uh, this is just a Tupperware thing. I think there was candy in there at one point. So sometimes I'll use that or glass containers for Tupperware when I'm bringing lunch to and from school. I have a handkerchief here and then reusable beeswax as well that um, we had an event last year that we were able to make them in the, through the sustainability office. Uh, below here, I have just like a buff band and um, a fabric mask that's reusable. Um, this is a journal that uh, Ryan's wife Monica made for me out of a uh, recycled calendar. And then um, I I'm not exactly sure what the paper was in there, but usually I am just using uh, an iPad that I got this year with an Apple Pencil. And my goal with that was to not be going through as much paper, especially with my classes, I was using a lot of paper printing out all of the PowerPoint slides for each lecture, which seemed like a lot, and then buying new notebooks and folders. And so it was a tough choice for me to decide between buying an iPad or um, continuing to print out those slides, knowing that with an iPad, there are a lot of precious materials being mined for that. And also I'm using electricity on a daily basis. Um, but that just seemed to make the most sense for me. And so I've been really enjoying it, but there's definitely um, like a give and take with having that versus printing out paper and using paper on a daily basis. Um, below that, I have my helmet, which I try to commute to school at least once a week, which has been going pretty well. I live on the east side by Leicester. So for me, sometimes I'm not super thrilled to bike up Glenwood right away in the morning, but <laughs> there's that. And then uh, this isn't always in my backpack, these bags, but I do try to keep bags in my um, car so that if I ever am having to go to the grocery store, I have that as well as um, in the blue bag, you can't see it, but there are some jars in there so that if I'm going to the bulk section, then I can just use jars rather than having to use plastic. And yeah, that is what I have. I apologize for my voice. <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> so. Yeah, thanks so much, Michaela. Um, and Elena and all our speakers for sharing stuff. Um, at this point, we are open to uh, fielding some questions from uh, attendees. And if you want to just type them in the chat box, we are happy to um, kind of field them or share them out with the panelists. And um, you are also welcome to let us know if you want to pop in visually and um, ask your question in person too, and we can bump you up so we can do that as well. Um, to start things off, I'd, I have a question and I'm kind of curious how, um, you know, our different panelists have different experiences and stuff, but uh, when COVID and the pandemic started happening, I got like, I wasn't sure about how to, you know, is, should I be using plastic bags in the grocery store? Um, what should I be doing about just health and safety for my own self? Um, and I, I don't know, like, I feel like I've figured out some of this stuff, but I was wondering if there is any things uh, that you guys can share about how COVID has affected kind of decisions you've made regarding um, your zero waste lifestyle the past few months. And anyone's welcome to jump in. I can start if you want. Um, so, I feel like COVID has really um, even more so ingrained in my mind that um, zero waste is not about being perfect. Um, the term zero waste is this, you know, absolute term. It's, you know, creating zero waste. And um, that feels really intimidating to people who are looking into going zero waste or implementing this idea and thinking, you know, how am I ever going to get to zero? And um, so really COVID, um, even though like I have, I create very little trash now and I use very little resources, um, there are phases in our life like COVID or, you know, if you 
um, just had a baby or um, are moving somewhere or started a new job. There's all of these different um, transitions and phases in our life where it can be more tricky to um, implement certain zero waste habits. And it's, it's so important that we don't um, tend to this idea that we have to do everything perfectly and we have to do everything that everybody else is doing. Um, but really just making it sustainable for ourselves and doing the best we can in the moment that we are in and um, just moving forward as you can. And so um, that really has helped my mindset. Um, COVID just kind of even more so implemented that in my mind. Um, so I don't know if, if that helps answer some questions about it, but that, that's kind of how I've been impacted by COVID. So, yeah. Well, that's great. Anyone else have thoughts on this? How it's affected you? I guess for me, it has affected my research that I'm doing because like originally I wanted to go through the recycling bins and actually sort through to see what are being recycled and what um, contaminations are in there. And so I couldn't do that. And also in these areas, um, usually like prior to COVID and everything, um, people would usually utilize that area a lot. But since COVID happened and it hasn't been been used that much and not many wastes are in the recycling bins and um, the people who work in facilities are not picking it up every day which is kind of like affecting my data the accuracy of everything. That's a really good point Claudine I hadn't thought about that but that really impacts what you're trying to do <laughs> it's not normal times. Um, we had a really great question come up about soaps and hygiene products and yeah, Elena perks up. Um, she's been doing some videos for our Instagram, so I'm going to let her take that question first, and then if anyone else wants to hop on to that. <laughs> I have quite a few things related to that topic. That's kind of my favorite, because that's where I started. Um, for facial soaps, uh, I would recommend, uh, I know I work at the Whole Foods Co-op, so a lot of my experience related to COVID has started since I worked at the co-op and I've seen a lot of products at the store and um, anything that comes in a cardboard box. I know the co-op sells a lot of variety in that essence. Um, I'm not so sure about Super One. I know Target also has box soaps, but even starting there. Um, and then there's also at the co-op, there is bulk shampoo, bulk conditioner, bulk dish soap, bulk laundry detergent, um, and I believe that covers the bases. I don't think there's a general soap. I know there's an all-purpose soap, and if you would like to use that for your body, I'm sure that's fine. Uh, I'm not sure if it's specific for the face, um, but that's the soap aspect is stuff that you can uh, refill uh, in the bulk section or um, something in a cardboard box. And then there's also, if you're really, really interested in the DIY side of soap, um, I could provide in the chat a website that you can make your own soap. I've done it before. All you need is oil, lye, and something called super fat, which is just like extra oil. Um, and you can kind of play around with what kind of oils you want to use. Like um, you can avoid palm oil and try to choose like hemp oil, which is really sustainable. And then you can also gear it towards like your skin type as well. Um, so that's soap. Um, for other like hygiene, I have um, my own deodorant, um, which you can make very easily. Uh, there is a video detailing how to make that on the uh, UMD Instagram. So to plug ourselves there, um, I could touch on it as well here, but if interested, there's more details in that video than what I can provide here. Um, but it's just four ingredients, uh, cornstarch, uh, baking soda, essential oils, uh, coconut oil, and you can also use shea butter um, if your skin is very sensitive. Um, that kind of adds more hydration there. 
So that's one way that you could do that. And then you could also make your own lotion as well. Or um, for the face, I have extremely sensitive skin, so I can't do any like natural oils or anything. I have something that can be recycled. Sorry, the lid is off, um, but it's just in a plastic container. It can at the very least be recycled or Honestly, we'll probably use this at the bulk section to fill up with like cashews or something. Um, but that's what comes to mind right away. And you could also, I know Jana knows more about it. You can make your own toothpaste as well. Um, so we could try and compile all of the DIY recipes that we have and provide that for uh, post uh, webinar for people to look at because it's really easy to start doing and it's kind of fun and you feel better doing it and it reduces a lot of waste as well. So that's my spiel, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. Um, anybody have any additional thoughts that Elena didn't touch on? I can add something too. Um, so about in June, I, um, I ran out of shampoo and I was trying to figure out you know, how to go about getting shampoo without any sort of plastic at all. Um, so I was looking into like the shampoo bars and conditioner bars and looking to see if anybody made them locally, which they do. Um, but then I ended up deciding to go no poo, which is basically you let your hair get back to its natural state and uh, you don't use really shampoo or conditioner on it at all. Um, and so that was back in June. And since then, I've only washed my hair twice with a rye flower um, shampoo. So basically, you just have fine rye flour and you mix it into a paste with a little water and you rub that into your hair. Um, it works for my hair type. I know for other people, for no poo, it might not work for them. So know your own hair type and you can give it a try. But it ended up working really well for mine. And um, and yeah, your hair just kind of gets back to this um, natural state of not being really dried out by shampoo because it's a detergent. And um, and so, yeah, I that's how I do it now. I don't use any shampoo or conditioner. And so that's uh, one way to, you know, refuse for the zero waste. The first zero waste step is, um, you know, if you can refuse it, if your hair type would allow it, then um, yeah, that's a really great way to do it. Um, I just use a boar hair brush to um, brush the sebum, which is what that, um, it's not actually like oil, it's, it's like more of like a waxy feel, but um, you can just brush that through your hair better with that type of brush. And um, yeah, so, and then also since I've stopped using um, soap on my body for the most part besides washing my hands, um, the natural oils have really come back to my skin and my um, my hair and I don't need lotion now for my skin because the natural oils have come back and I'm not drying it out constantly with a detergent. So um, that's a something different too for soap. So yeah. Awesome. Um, we had another really great question come in, um, and I'm going to try and combine some thoughts here. Um, zero waste can often be maybe limited to folks, um, you know, maybe presented as white, affluent, privileged, um, a type of thing. Um, and then thinking about as college students, um, the question that came through the chat was, you know, limited budget as a college student, um, shopping at the co-op might seem a little out of reach. Like what are some, um, some ideas that you have um, for this to be accessible, no matter your income level? Um, and then are there things that you have maybe saved on? And then you can put a little bit more towards your, your different aspects of, of what you're trying to reach. Michaela, you wanna start with this one? Yeah, for me, I have definitely found that sometimes shopping at the co-op, things will seem more expensive, but a lot of times when I'm buying them in bulk, especially if I'm bringing my own container, it's actually equivalent, if not less than what it would be if I was buying a packaged product. And then with that, as I'm buying a lot of things, like April had mentioned, 
her making her own chips, when you make your own thing, it's often less expensive as well. So it might be more time consuming in the long run, but if you're not buying a product that's already pre-made, you're likely going to save money. Um, that's what I've found, at least in terms of grocery shopping. And then um, even like back to talking about soaps, I just buy all bar soaps now. And so I've had a conditioner bar and a shampoo bar and even my soap for my body has lasted a really long time, probably a lot longer than it would have if I had bought um, like a bottle in a plastic container. So I think um, just kind of making those swaps and taking more time for things and then also um, just buying those different products can actually save money in the long run. Um, it might not seem like it up front, but that's what I've found for myself. Awesome. Anybody else? Thoughts on that? I would say that an alternative, I'm sorry, uh, an alternative to the co-op for like produce, uh, Aldi's typically has uh, bulk produce that you can get without plastic packaging. And they always have like pretty good selection. And most of the time it is organic. Um, so you can kind of weigh like, yes, it's plastic, but it's organic. And sometimes when you don't have the resources to always buy zero waste, it is kind of nice to take those other aspects of sustainability into consideration while you're limiting what you can. Because um, sometimes we are just completely bound by the circumstances. So um, that's what I would say, all these. <laughs> Claudina, college student thoughts? Um, I also do like shop uh, Aldi's just buy in bulk and like the stuff that I use is a lot of you know organic and just like uh, farm grown kind of products and also my family lives on a farm so I get um, stuff from their place too so I mean if people have access to that that'd be great but like not many people do have access to that and also thinking of it is just um, it, it's very difficult with the structure of how our society function is difficult um, for everybody to be on that level of zero waste because some people have some resources while others are limited in resources and for us to truly like reach the state the state of zero waste we need to like change uh, how our system is functioning so that um, it like focus on the equity aspect of it. We need to make sure that everyone are on the same page because some people may have access to others while others are limited in um, their opportunities of what they can do to reach a state of sustainability. So just make sure that people are like uh, on the same page and have access to all these opportunities and everything, then we could probably like move forward and address some of those sustainable issues. Absolutely. So I want to get one final thought from each of you. Um, and then any questions that haven't been answered in the chat, we'll try to send out to our panelists um, after the fact and get those responses back out. Um, how important or how does zero waste figure into your overall sustainable life? Um, and how do you balance the other parts of sustainability? Because sustainability can include so many things as um, you have all already alluded to. April, do you want to start? And then maybe we'll go, we'll go April, Michaela, Claudina, and then Elena. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, zero waste is involved in practically every aspect of my life because um, it's a mindset shift. And so once you start being intentional about what material things are in your life and reducing down to, you know, using only the resources and things that you need, um, your whole mindset shifts with everything. Um, and that includes, you know, biking somewhere, you know, the resources you use for your car or even like your relationships. Um, what is, what is serving you in your life? Um, your job, your, how you spend your time, um, your thought patterns, you know, zero waste really is this mindset shift of being very intentional about your life. And, um, it goes much deeper than just the trash you create. And it's, yeah, it's an amazing journey to be on, but that's what I would add for that. So. Yeah, I agree with April. As Claudina was just talking about um, a farm, one of the things that I did this summer, um, and I just finished this last week, 
was I volunteered um, as a CSA worker and then got a CSA share from a farm. So for me, that um, was, it was enabling me to do zero waste things with just getting my produce and then being able to bring that home and not having any packaging there. And then also with that and just buying right from local vendors that um, has helped me be more sustainable from uh, supporting local and being a part of my community and then connecting with nature in different ways. So I would agree it's it really is a mindset shift and then kind of a lifestyle change as well that has helped me to live a full sustainable life. Adina? Could you repeat the question for me? My computer froze. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so how important or what, what role does zero waste kind of figure into your sustainable life? Okay, so for me, I try to recycle a lot of my waste. So, and especially like buying things um, either in bulk or just um, in packages that can be recycled or just like buy less thinking of it like, do you really need it? Uh, if you really don't need it, then why buy it? So like, uh, as mentioned, it's all like a mindset thing. So just really thinking about like, what do you need? And um, other things of like, you would like, but at this moment, it's like, you really don't need it. So just focusing on reducing your waste in that aspect. I would say that zero waste kind of helps play a role in my sustainability by keeping a presence of mindfulness and really considering what I own and what I do and what the impact of how I live my life is as a whole. And that kind of ties into like educating people where if I'm being cautious of like, for example, like my roommates get coffee a lot and whenever I'm with them, I'm like, can you ask not to get a straw? Like you're already producing the recyclable plastic container. The straw isn't recyclable. So like just being mindful about that and trying to like help people who are willing to make those changes kind of remind them as well. Um, once they say that they want to start doing it, it's just a matter of like community uh watching each other and learning by doing and experiencing with each other so it kind of ties into a lot of sustainability a lot of the same mindsets and themes excellent um any final thoughts or things that you didn't get to share yet that you would like to share with our audience who is still hanging with us I think sometimes it can feel really intimidating to start doing zero waste things. I know it was for me when you look at a lot of things on the internet and there's a list of all these things that you have to switch out. And I would say like how April had mentioned when you're doing your waste audit, just start with one thing so that it doesn't feel as overwhelming. And at least for me, I found that once I started, it kind of became addicting of like, oh, what else can I do? And it, it does become really fun, but um, like it's normal to kind of feel intimidated like that. But I think it can be fun if you make it that way. Anything else? All right. Well, I appreciate you all so very much for joining us. Um, this has been just a great conversation. Um, and sadly, Ryan had to step out to another meeting. Um, so just wanna let everybody know if you have additional questions or would like to connect directly with um, Scholastica or UMD Sustainability offices, please reach out um, on our screen. I'm gonna share a screen real quick. Um, hard to do without my co-pilot. So just bear with me. Um, and then our next series is going to be on October 28th and we're gonna be focusing on energy savings. Um, so we will be having speakers